crawl upon the surface of the earth. You entertain in human ideas in so familiar a manner as to appear wholly unmoved by the scenes of blood and desolation you describe. The affairs of your country, England, you speak of, appear to me nothing more than a heap of conspiracies, murders, massacres, banishments, revolutions, and the very worst effects that avarice, faction hypocrisy, perfidiousness, cruelty, rage, malice, envy, and ambition can produce. Few things please me more in life than new discoveries in art or in nature. But some evil genius, an enemy to mankind, must be the first contriver to all you describe. In the course of ages, we have been troubled by the same disease the whole of mankind is subject to. The struggle for absolute dominion. Those times are past and are tempered by the laws in our kingdom devoted to morality, history, poetry and mathematics, to what may be useful in life. It is my belief that whoever can make two ears of corn or two blades of grass grow upon a spot of ground where only one grew before deserves better of mankind and does more essential service to his country than the whole race of politicians put together. to me. What am I doing to myself? How did I get here? Oh. Filthy, filthy, you disgust me. Martha, come and clean me up. I've made a mess. I'm a mess. I'm dying. <laughs> Last week I saw a woman flayed, and you'd hardly believe how much it altered a person for the worse. <coughs> Dr. Swift, the important visitors are here. Your grace, an honour and a privilege, as always. The bishop. Our big day. <coughs> Stella! Stella, where are you? It's our big day! There you are. You look handsome. Radiant. Come. Wait, a moment. My wig, my wig, my periwig, 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 my brand new periwig, brand new periwig, <laughs> 17 shillings and six, 17 shillings and six pence. Where is it? Where is it? Where is it? Periwig, periwig, I must have my best. Best, best. Periwig, Where is it? Where is it? Oh. There you are, you little oh. rogue. Oh. 
Dr. Swift is himself again. Come. Last night it is time. To me, my true love. This pair I wed in rain and thunder. Let God in heaven ne'er tear asunder. Bless this man and woman I stand before. Let thief and scoundrel bed his sweet young whore. She came close beside me, and this she did say. It will not be long, love, till... On the death of Stella, this day being Sunday, January 28th, 1727, about eight o'clock at night. A servant brought me a note with an account of the death of the truest, most virtuous and valuable friend that I or perhaps any other person was blessed with. She expired about six in the evening of this day. And as soon as I am left alone, which is about 11 at night, I resolved for my own peace of mind to say something of her life and her character. She was sickly from her childhood until the age of about 15, but then grew into perfect health and was looked upon as one of the most beautiful, graceful and agreeable women in London, only a little fat. What would you give to have the history of Jonathan and Vanessa written exactly through all its steps from the beginning to this time? I believe it would do well in verse. It ought to be an exact chronicle of 12 years, from the time of spilling the coffee to drinking the coffee, from Dunstable to Dublin, with every single passage since. There would be the chapter of the blister, the chapter of Madame going to Kensington. The chapter of the wedding with the adventure of the lost key. The strain of the joyful return. 200 chapters of madness. The chapter of long war. The Berkshire surprise. 50 chapters of little time. The chapter of Chelsea. The chapter of swallow and cluster. The chapter of hide and whisper. The chapter of who made it so. Here is now three long, long weeks past since you wrote to me. 
Oh, happy Dublin, that can employ all your thoughts. I stayed but a fortnight in Dublin, and returned not one visit of the hundred that were made me. I prefer a field bed and an earthen floor before the great house there, they say, is mine. Once I had a friend who would see me sometimes, and either commend what I did, or advise me what to do. You once had a maxim which was to act what was right, and not mind what the world said. Your letter put me in such confusion that I could not tell what to do. I even feared the tittle-tattle of this nasty little town where everything is known in a week and magnified in a hundred degrees. Tell me, sincerely, if you have once wished with earnestness to see me since I last wrote to you. I was born with violent passions that terminate all in one. An inexpressible passion I have for you. You have not once pitied me, though I showed you how I was distressed. Should I find you enraged, still you would be the deity I worship. Consider those killing emotions which I feel from your neglect of me. And show some tenderness to me or I shall lose my senses. I fly from the spleen to the world's end. You run out of your way to meet it. While you continue to be splenetic, count upon it, I will always preach. The best companion for you is a philosopher. Father! Ah! I'm thinking myself fast into the spleen, ah! which is the only thing I would not compliment you by imitating. If you continue to treat me as you do, you will not be made uneasy by me long. It is impossible to describe what I have suffered since I last saw you. I am sure I could have borne the rack much better than the <coughs> killing, <coughs> killing words of yours. Sometimes I am resolved to die. For God's sake, get your friends about you to advise. I want comfort myself in this case and can give little. Time alone must give it to you. What a foolish thing is time. How foolish a man who would be angry if time stopped. Nothing now is your part but decency. I pity you, most of all the creatures alive.
The Academy of Sciences <coughs> at Legado in Laputa is not an entire single building, but a continuation of houses on both sides of the street. I was received very kindly by the warden there and went to the academy for many days. Each room hath in it one or more projectors, and I believe there could be no fewer than 500 different rooms. Investigations. Welcome! Yes. I will present my experiment. Here, I am working on an operation to reduce human excrement to its original food <laughs> by separating the several parts, removing the tincture which it receives from the gall, making the odor exhale and scumming of the saliva. I receive a weekly allowance mm. from the Society for this filled with human excrement about the bigness of a barrel. Furthermore, for discovering of plots and conspiracies against the government, I advise all great statesmen to examine the diet of all suspected persons, <laughs> their time of eating, upon which side they lie in bed, with which hand they work the posteriors to take a strict view of the excrement from the taste, the crudeness, the consistence, and maturity of digestion form judgment of their thoughts and desires. Because I have found out by frequent experiment that men are never so serious, intent, and thoughtful as when they are at stool. For instance, a man who was considering the best way of murdering the king, <laughs> his excrement, would have the tincture of green. Quite different, though, if he thought of raising an insurrection or burning the metropolis. <laughs> it would appear, sir, that your investigations are not altogether complete. Oh, wait, 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 mine is the most don't complete. Don't worry, My method is next, I think. Andy Bannon, <laughs> miss. What investigations are you pursuing? Okay, well, well, my project is a scheme for entirely abolishing all words whatsoever. And this would be a great advantage, yeah, in point of health as well as brevity. It's plain that every word we speak is by some degree a diminution of our lungs by corrosion and consequently contributes to the shortening of our lives. And since words are only names for things, it would be more convenient for all men to carry about them such things as are necessary to express the particular business they are to discourse on. And this theory would already be in practice if women, in conjunction with the vulgar and the illiterate, had not threatened to raise a rebellion unless they might be allowed the liberty to speak with their tongues in the manner of their forefathers. But such are the irreconcilable enemies to science. However, many of the most learned and wise adhere to the new scheme of expressing themselves by things, which has only this inconvenience attending it. Dr. Schwarzheiser. Yeah. 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 <laughs> that if a man's business be very great and of various kinds, he would therefore be obliged in proportion to carry a greater bundle, a greater bundle, Dr. Schwarzheiser, thank you. A greater bundle of things upon his back. No, a greater bundle of things, Dr. Schwarzheiser, thank you. Unless he can afford one or two strong servants to attend him. So when they meet in the streets, two sages lay down their loads, open up their sacks, and hold conversation for an hour together, like this. <laughs> yeah, okay. They then put up their implements, so they put up their implements. Okay, they help each other to resume their, they help each other to resume their burdens. Thank you, Dr. Schwarzheiser, and they take their leave. But for short conversations, a man may carry implements in his pockets or under his arms, enough to supply him. And of course, in his house, he cannot be at a loss. Therefore, the rumor company me who practice my theory should be full of things 
ready at hand, requisite to furnish matter for conversation. It will also serve as a universal language to be understood in all civilized nations whose goods and utensils are of the same kind or nearly resembling, so that their uses might be comprehended. Thus, ambassadors will be qualified to treat with foreign princes or ministers of state to whose tongues they would otherwise be utter strangers. <laughs> wow. Well, that's it. <laughs> well done. Thank you so much. And my method, my method is now, I think, this. Yes. So. Uh, my method is this. I have the most wonderful contrivance to reconcile political parties in a state who are violent. Mm. Take 100 leaders of each party. Dispose them into couples of such whose heads are nearest in size. <laughs> then let two nice operators saw off the occiput of each couple at the same time and in such a manner that the brain could be equally divided. <laughs> let the occiput thus cut off be interchanged, applying each to the head of his opposite party man. <laughs> It is a work that requires some exactness, but if dexterously performed, the cure will be infallible. Oh, two half <laughs> being left to debate the matter between themselves uh -huh. in the space of the same skull will soon come to a good understanding and produce that moderation as well as the regularity of thinking so much to be wished for in the head of those who imagine they come into the world only to watch and govern its motion. As to the difference of brains in quantity or quality among those who are in different factions, rest assured, this is a perfect trifle. My dear sir, allow me to introduce myself. I am Dr. Johnson. Uh, I see you have already met my team of projectors, Dr. Schwarzheiser, <laughs> the <laughs> lovely Lossie Vandeville. Hi! Miss <laughs> and the very eminent Camille Darling. Rimsky Kosakov. <laughs> Madam, how do you like our facility? Eh. Uh, it's most unusual, sir. <laughs> and most edifying! Yeah. <laughs> to your satisfaction, then. Most satisfactory! I wonder, would you be interested in assisting us with a small experiment with an Certainly. What kind of experiment? Well, it's in the nature of a personality test. You would prove a most rewarding subject. Of course! If I could be of any assistance, it would be an honour! Thank you so much. If you care to step this way, up here, step up here, take Miss Vanderbilt's <laughs> oh, <coughs> take my hand. Yes, take her hand and lower <laughs> yourself down into the apparatus. Just like so, that's it. Just sit yourself down and there. Just get yourself comfy. I just can yeah. up here. Perfect. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to tonight's demonstration. As you can see, the subject is safely secured in the apparatus, so we may begin. Bestial savage or reasoning being, a degradation of spirit or a perfection of nature, a yahoo or a hunahim? <laughs> that is the question. What's going on here? I'm Jonathan Swift! This is preposterous! I created you! I wish to leave now! Please relax and cooperate. Things will go better for you. This joke has gone up far enough! Ha! I see! Tis a joke! Tis a bite! Ha! Ah, tis excellent, sirs! For a moment, you had me taken in entirely! Gay, is that you? I buffed that it's you, isn't it? Don't deny it! Uh, Addison, how could you, you sly old dog? And my dear friend Mr. Pope looking all sheepish and innocent there. But once again, sirs, tis a bite! A veritable bite! A bite? You would bite for pleasure? This is Yahoo. No! I bite as in a practical joke. A reversal of the natural order of things. Why would you choose to reverse nature? This is Yahoo. To provoke thought. Provide amusement, merriment, blah. By saying the thing that is not, 
in the manner of speaking. This is not worthy. This is Yahoo. No, no. I'm Jonathan Swift. You fawn and flatter politicians to advance yourself, Yahoo. This is a fiction! You turn love to hate and destroy all those who care for you most. Yahoo! You speak and write degraded things and take pleasure in it. This is Yahoo. You twist the truth and mock and ridicule others to make yourself superior. This is Yahoo. Your scent appeals to Yahoo females. My name is Your Jonathan body Swift. shames you and Born you cover it with skin. Mother's name is Abigail Basham. Father John died when I was a small you boy. Speak Brought up for four years by my beloved nurse. Whoa! Educated in Kilkenny's Kenny School. Murder! Looks college. like Yahoo! Secretary to Sir William Temple. Treat like Yahoo! He was found by the Yahoo! Gentlemen, as you can see, this is quite clearly a disturbed Yahoo. He need a major Yahoo surgery. Should he be in any doubt about my qualifications for this operation, may I remind him I have a bill which permits me to bleed, cut, draw, lance, bend, embrocate, and kill as I see fit. To proceed to the procedure. As you can see, our patient has been gagged for his own safety. Our operation will release the humours in the patient's brain, thus curing him of all fits, headaches, tendency to blindness and all other causes of violent behaviour. I shall be cutting, or more precisely boring, a small hole in the skull of the patient with this instrument here. I shall be cutting a small groove which will be kept in place with a centre while the entire instrument is turned. Everybody wants to get to heaven. 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 But nobody wants to die. Nobody, 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 nobody wants to die. Nobody, 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 nobody wants to die. Everybody wants to get to heaven, but nobody wants to die. Nobody wants to die. Everybody wants to get to heaven, but nobody wants to die. Everybody wants to get to heaven, but nobody wants to die. Everybody wants to get to heaven. Everybody wants to get to heaven. Everybody wants to get to heaven. Everybody wants to get to heaven, but nobody wants to die. Nobody wants to die. One day, in much good company. I was asked by a person of quality whether I had seen any of the Struldbrugs or Immortals. He told me that sometimes, though very rarely, a child happened to be born with a red circular spot in the forehead directly over the left eyebrow, which was an infallible mark that it should never die. I cried out in rapture. Oh, happy nation! Where at least every child has a chance for being born immortal! Happy people, happy nation, 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 happy people, I addressed my discourse spoke with a sort of smile, which is usually reserved for pity to the ignorant. <coughs> he gave me a particular account of the Strawbrugs among them. He said they commonly acted like mortals until about <coughs> 30 years old. After which, by degree, they grew melancholy and dejected, increasing in both till they came to four score. They were peevish, covetous, vain, morose and talkative, but incapable of friendship and dead to all natural affection which never descended below their grandchildren. Envy and impotent desires were their prevailing passions, directed at the vices of the young and the deaths of the old. But by reflecting on the former, 
They found themselves cut off from all possibility of pleasure. The least miserable among them appear to be those who turn to dotage, entirely losing their memories. As soon as they have completed the term of 80 years, they are looked on as dead in law. Only a small pittance is reserved for their support. At 90, they lose their teeth and hair. They have at that age no distinction of taste, but eat and drink whatever they can get without relish or appetite. In talking, they forget the common appellation of things, even the names of those closest to them. They were hated and despised by all sorts of people. When one of them is born, it is reckoned ominous, and their birth is recorded very particularly. They were the most mortifying sight I ever beheld, ah. and the women more horrible than the men. Besides the usual deformities which accompany old age, they were subject to an additional ghastliness in proportion to their number of years which is too horrible to be described. I grew heartily ashamed of the pleasing visions which I had formed and thought no tyrant could invent a death from which I would not run with pleasure from such a life. Believe in God Almighty and in Christ Jesus, his only Son, our Lord, who was born of the Holy Spirit and the Virgin Mary, and was crucified under Pontius Pilate and was buried, and the third day rose again and ascended into heaven, and sitting on the right hand of the Father, whence have he come to judge the living and the dead? I believe in God Almighty and in Christ Jesus, his only Son, our Lord, who was born of the Holy Spirit and the Virgin Mary, who was crucified under Pontius Pilate and was buried, and the third day rose again and ascended into heaven and sitteth on the right hand of the Father. Damn, damn, damn! Thou shalt not take the Lord's name in vain! Swift! You blasphemer! Are you there? Don't you say damn you God anymore! I believe in God Almighty and in Christ Jesus, his only Son, our Lord, who was born of the Holy Spirit. Answer me! Why don't you believe in me? I do believe in you, in a manner of speaking. I conceive of some scattered notion of a superior being to be of use to common people and provide topics of amusement on a tedious winter's night. You! He's an unbeliever! Canaanite! Shiite! Hittite! Ammonite! Assyrian! A Babylonian! I believe in the power of man to create a just society based on a creed of rational discourse. Atheist! Humanist! Nonconformist! Communist! Nietzschean! Agnesian! Oh, that's quite enough! Jonathan, you're a good boy. He's not the only one who's proud of his son, you know. Who are you? Jonathan, it's Abigail, your mother. Rivers of fire, pillow of salt, tempus locust. Oh no, thy father and thy mother. Don't you remember all the nice things you wrote about me after I died? She was of a generous and hospitable nature, was very exact in all the duties of her religion, and went to church twice a day. If the way to heaven is through piety, charity, truth and justice, she is there. See how much you loved me? I'll treasure all those precious moments we spent together forever. We spent hardly any time together. Swift! Do you love me? Answer me! It's Jonathan, no point in getting distracted by intangibles like God. Swift! Grasp the fruit from the tree while it's ripe. Oh, come on, Swifty. I know you want to.
Come and drink your coffee in the slattery. You and I were always, always meant to be. Nothing's gonna take you, take you away from me no more. I can see you struggle. You can trust in me. Genius of wit. Come and play with me. Nothing's gonna take you. You've done well with yourself. Look at you, Lena St. Patrick's, you must be so proud. All the family in Leicestershire still ask after you. Oh, Jonathan, tell me you still love me. Swift, I'm warning you, your time is up. Jonathan, wake up and smell the coffee. You've done so much for others. Well, why don't you give yourself a I have oranges and sugar, chocolate and venison. A special haunch I had sent over for you. Promise me you'll try at least an ounce. Nothing's gonna take you, take you away from me. Pity me, my sweet, sweet presto. Forgive me. I'm sorry I left you. Nothing's gonna take you. We are all yahoos of this godless hell. And civilized savagery rings our history's bell. For existence is held in the memory of man. Mine is gone now. I must testify what I can. Satirical genius dictates this final scan. I am what I am! 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 I am what I am. I am what I am. I am what I am.